Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Improving College and Career Readiness for All Students. We really appreciate your taking the time to participate today, and we also appreciate the sponsors of today's webinar, which are uh, Pivot Learning and the Link Learning Alliance. Before we begin, I'd like to review just a few quick housekeeping items. We welcome your questions and we encourage you to send them in at any time during the presentation. We'll be holding a Q&A at the end of the webinar, uh, but you can send your question in at any time. To do that, just use the questions feature in your control panel, type your question into the top box, and then click send. I'll receive your question and I'll put it into the queue to be answered at the end. We do have several panelists today, so if your question is specific to one of them, you want to particularly get their insight, if you would just include that person's name along with your question, we can make sure it gets directed to the correct person. If you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, you can use that same questions feature to get my attention and I'll do my best to resolve the problem for you. Uh, one of the biggest issues that people run into um, is issues with audio and sometimes there can be a lag if your internet connection maybe isn't um, as strong as it needs to be. Um, you always have the option to call in by phone and sometimes that works better. You can stay on um, in, their, in the internet looking at the slides um, but join the audio portion by phone. We are going to be showing a video today that also takes quite a bit of bandwidth. So if there is a slowdown while we're playing that video, um, I think things will probably pick back up for you once we get out of the video and back to the slides. But hopefully everybody's Internet is strong and there will be no disruptions for you. Uh, finally, we will be sharing a recording of the webinar with you as well as a copy of the slide deck. So just keep an eye on your email inbox tomorrow for information on how to access those materials. Now let's get started. I'm pleased to welcome all of our panelists. As I mentioned, we have several with us today. We're going to start the program with Robert Curtis, who is Vice President of Education Programs for Pivot Learning. Prior to joining Pivot, Robert was the Director of Regional Support and Assistant Director of Teaching and Learning for Connect Ed, the California Center for College and Career. Robert has extensive experience working nationally with school, district, post-secondary, and workforce leaders building local capacity to transform educational systems and improve student outcomes. He's also former director of curriculum and instruction for Sonoma Valley Unified School District. Robert is joined today by Dan Storrs, who is senior director, K-12 engagement at the Link Learning Alliance. Dan is a career educator who began teaching middle school math and social studies. He went on to become a K-8 schools principal and lead that, led the effort to build one of the first blended learning programs in the San Francisco area. We're really excited to have with us today two educators from Oceanside High School in Oceanside, California. Teresha Collis is principal at Oceanside is in her, and is in her fourth year as a high school administrator. She has also been a high school teacher and a military education leadership instructor in the United States Air Force. Teresa is joined by Juan Hernandez, who is a pathway lead for the Environmental Science and Engineering Academy at Oceanside. Juan began his teaching career in Los Angeles at two startup charter high schools. He then took a break from the classroom to work in the field of environmental health and safety, but came back to teaching and used his industry experience to obtain a CTE credential. I know we're all looking forward to hearing from all of our panelists, so I'm going to go ahead and turn the program over to Robert, who's going to get us started now. Great, thanks Emily. Uh, welcome everyone, I'm Robert Curtis from Pivot Learning. Uh, Pivot is a nonprofit uh, organization based in Oakland, California, and our mission is to partner with educators, design and implement solutions to the greatest challenges to achieve educational justice. Uh, excited today to be joined by my colleagues, Dan Storrs from Link Learning Alliance, and Teresa and Juan, uh, who have been working with the last few years to implement some Link Learning Pathways in Oceanside, and you'll get to hear more about that. Uh, at Pivot, we believe that in order to achieve real improvement in student outcomes, we have to collaborate with educators, to design solutions, uh, and deploy them in our needy schools. And you'll get to hear a little bit about what that look like in Oceanside. Uh, next slide. So a little bit about Pivot Learning. In 2018, Pivot worked with approximately 106 school districts, uh, and about 58% of students in Pivot partner districts are low income. Next slide. So we're gonna do a quick survey here. Uh, Emily's gonna launch the survey and we'll uh, talk about the results just to get some background uh, to hear about how familiar you are with Link Learning. Emily? Yes, I am launching that now and we'll just give people a few seconds to answer and see what um, where people are with this process.
All right, we'll give it just five more seconds. Great. So it looks like um, the majority of people, 70%, are actually not very familiar at all with linked learning, but we are going to take care of that here shortly. Dan's going to walk us through that. Um, so you will be much more informed uh, by the end of the webinar. Um, and it does look like we've got just a handful of people um, who are actually working on pathways and getting ready to be certified. So that's great. All right, great. Thanks, Emily. <clears throat> so next slide. All right, so why the focus on college and career readiness? Well, by 2020, as you can see by the slide, 65% of the jobs will require post-secondary education and training. Yet in 2018, only 30% of ACT tested grads met at least three or four core college readiness benchmarks. Um, next slide. And only 11% of business leaders agree that college grads have the skills their business need, and disadvantaged students are less likely to be prepared for college, career, college and career, even in high-performing schools. Uh, this slide here shows a bit of the discrepancy between uh, what college grads uh, think in terms of their readiness versus the employers. So you can see across a number of key skills, college grads, and this is similar to what high school students also think when they go into post-secondary programs, they feel like they're prepared and have the skills, yet when they get into uh, the workforce or even into the post-secondary institutions, they're often underprepared. Uh, and one of our focuses with our link learning work is to make sure that students are better prepared when they actually enter into the post-secondary and or workforce. Okay, next slide. So pivot learning, a couple of things here. One is we use uh, both link learning, which Dan Storz will explain in a moment, as well as design thinking to engage community of educators, families, workforce, and post-secondary other partners to really solve the complex challenges of better preparing our students for both college and career. Uh, you'll get to hear uh, quite a bit about the design uh, process that we used at Oceanside, and they'll talk through what that looked like, as well as to hear about how they engaged uh, various stakeholders in this process and how they kept them engaged in the process. Uh, another important piece of the work is this really is focused on continuous improvement. It's not about putting in a single program, but really how do we uh, put in a program and focus on improving that, as well as developing the kind of cultures for both adults and students uh, where they're learning and developing themselves to really see uh, the results for kids uh, coming out of these programs. So, uh, next slide. So, at this point, I'd like to introduce Dan Storch from the Link Learning Alliance. He's going to take us through a little bit and give some background about link learning. Thanks for being here, Dan. Thanks, Robert. Uh, well, I want to say a little bit about the certification. Uh, link, the Link Learning Alliance uh, in general. Um, is an organization designed to uh, promote uh, the field of link learning and promote uh, high quality pathways. And um, to that degree, certification promotes the continuous learning and improvement of pathways to provide proven high quality integrated learning experiences uh, and positive student outcomes for all students. Both the silver and gold levels provide pathway teams the opportunity for comprehensive self-assessment and independent evaluation and validation of the pathway work. Um, and it's really focused on three buckets, and those are the program of study that includes your um, integrated projects, your performance-based assessments, and really connecting uh, learning for kids, the learning in their core academics with their CT and career uh, cl coursework. Um, the second bucket is the work-based learning and providing uh, students with the um, continuum of work-based learning experiences. And the third key, very important to equity, is student supports and making sure that those are um, integrated with the program of study and um, that they are closely aligned with the students' needs. And so the key factors here for the integrated program of study are rigorous and equitable instructional design and delivery, um, along with the performance-based assessment of student learning. And again, that's really designed to uh, promote the cross-subject learning and make learning relevant for the kids. Um, it includes early uh, access to early college credit opportunities, uh, as well as post-secondary and industry partner involvement 
in the curriculum design um, and delivery. And it includes shared learning experiences for students through the cohort structure. And the work-based learning, it's uh, personalized. So it's personalized learning plan that includes a personalized learning plan tied to pathway outcomes, as well as equitable access to and completion of multiple experiences. And those kinds of things can be internships, apprenticeships, job shadowing, the whole range of activities, as well as certificate opportunities. Students' self-assessment of experiences and growth is an important piece of it so that students understand that the skills uh, that they are gaining through these experiences, as well as workplace readiness assessment of students by supervisors so that the kids are getting feedback from uh, career and industry representatives. And then the last, integrated student supports. Learning opportunities emphasize social awareness, self-management, growth mindset, and most importantly, self-efficacy. Uh, teachers and counselors monitor student needs and provide targeted supports. Students introduced to a variety of post-secondary options set goals, so they are always connecting their, uh, their career goals, life goals, with their college and uh, higher academic goals. And students receive college prep support and develop job application skills. Part of the process uh, for certification, um, well, first let me say that there are, so there's the different levels. So there's a candidate level, which is basically when you are ready to go, you've uh, signed into the certification system and answers a few questions and building really your program. Um, and silver certification recognizes those pathways that have put the basic foundational structures in place in their pathway that will ultimately lead to really high quality program and outcomes for the students. Um, and that's recognized in the highest level of certification, which is the gold certification. So what does it take to be silver certified? You need to identify a, a strong pathway design or planning team uh, that includes pathway, district, and industry and post-secondary partners. You engage key stakeholders to help design and improve the pathway. And you conduct a self-study uh, to reflect on your strengths and identify the areas where you want to improve or grow. And finally, you want to implement action steps to develop the pathway and to begin to collect the artifacts that align with the standards. And to that end, uh, we have developed the Link Learning Alliance together with Pivot Learning um, has developed a, a self-study tool that can help guide you um, through the process. And it will be an online tool to help track your progress towards silver and gold certification. You can complete it as individuals or as a team and use it as many times as you like. And uh, you can generate PDF reports with each submission so your progress can be tracked over time. This is a tool that, it's a new tool, we're very excited about this, and it will be ready uh, next week, hopefully by the end of next week, and you'll receive information on how to link to that in the follow-up emails that you'll receive to this webinar. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Juan and Teresa from Ocean High, Oceanside High School. All right, thank you, Dan. Um, hi, um, as said in introductions, my name is Teresa Collis and um, I am the principal at Oceanside High School. Uh, I'm a proud graduate of this high school, dating back to class of 1985. Uh, the school was really just as diverse then as it is today, as you can see by the slide. And that is something that we really treasure and think that is very special about our school population. Um, with that in mind, um, something that we don't see on the slide is that we also have a 15% of our students are military affiliated. We're located about two miles 
from one of the largest military installations, Camp Pendleton. So that brings to us, in some cases, a transient population as students and um, families um, move in and uh, move away, um, meeting their, their military needs. Along with that, we also have a 12% special education population. Uh, next slide. So as you can see, uh, dating back three years ago, our graduation rate was one that um, needs to improve, as well as the post-secondary programs and the percentage of students that had a plan beyond high school and that they were in fact pursuing that. Um, for the past several years, we have actually had two very successful career academies. We had a Health Careers Academy and Academy of Justice. The Health Academy has been in existence here at Oceanside for about 19 years and was doing an incredible job maintaining uh, a very consistent practice, um, such as the practice of cohorting students, uh, systematic student supports, and then bringing rigorous uh, CTE course offerings to students in the Health Careers Academy. And our Academy at Justice was doing um, a, a fine job as well. The academic success was also connected to um, the uh, success of those two pathways. We looked at the students that were connected to these two pathways, and there were a higher rate of students that were seeing it through to graduation. And then they also had post-secondary goals that they were actually following through on. So in looking through a lens of equity, um, it's, it's blatantly obvious that there was a wide variation of experiences that students were having here on our campus. Um, some other data is 70% of our students here at Oceanside High School also qualify for free or reduced lunch. So we are primarily a, um, a population of, that come from blue collar families. So to address this, equity. Uh, three years ago, I had an opportunity to um, connect with Pivot, who could help us navigate a transformation that would result in all students having um, a similar high school experience that would connect their learning to the world of work, that would teach all students 21st century soft skills, as well as um, give them the individualized supports that they needed to see through to graduation and post-secondary post options. Next slide. The, the journey that we embarked on started with the creation of a design team. The design team was open to all staff and it also included students, parents, representatives from the junior college, district leadership, as well as local industry partners. We reached out to middle school parents and students as well. Our work was grounded in design thinking. So at each meeting, we would walk away with tasks or actions to accomplish over the, the next month prior to our, our following meeting. We utilized staff meetings and surveys to share where we were at in our work and to get feedback on our design process. In the slide there, it gives some specific examples of the different actions that we were taking that aligned with the design thinking process. So we started in our, our pre-work and doing a lot of research. Um, and then we sat and interpreted what the research told us. And then we did brainstorming, coming up with a prototype. The prototype process, we actually revisited three different occasions until we refined it to where we were, um, where we were happy where we landed on the four pathways that you'll see in the next slide. So after looking at several different um, data points around our, our county, we came up with um, three, I'm sorry, we came up with four pathways. The, um, I'm sorry. The UC3 listed, we actually had a business pathway in our year one implementation. Our public service pathway uh, consisted of three academies and they were already in existence. 
And then we also had via a bond that was passed years ago. At the same time we were starting this work, we uh, celebrated the opening of a new state-of-the-art performing arts center that we're very excited about. So naturally our arts digital media and design pathway was uh, an option that rose to the top to really take advantage of that new state-of-the-art facility that we have right here on our campus. Um, and then we had the environmental science and engineering pathway. We were leveraging that we already had two CTE teachers who could teach uh, CTE courses that would align with these two different academies. Um, in regards to our, our business pathway, we, we did start with a business pathway, but after year one, we recognized that we didn't have the resources to support the building out of a brand new pathway. So at that time, we made the decision to collapse that and focus on the three pathways and all the um, academies that fall under each pathway. Um, next slide. So in looking at our, um, our year one and year two, we focused on um, building capacity of our pathway leads as well as our department chairs to lead the work of our teachers now coming together and collaborating uh, interdisciplinary um, in, 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 a, in a dis interdisciplinary way. So for the first time we started bringing um, teachers together across content to collaborate on um, CTE standards. Uh, they were able to share other, other standards and skills that other teachers were working on, um, as well as creating project-based um, units of study and working, working interdisciplinary on projects and sharing um, and talking about the students that they share. Next slide. So going into year one implementation, some of the other things that we recognized is that uh, our staff had some fears around this, this kind of change. Um, our staff here at Oceanside High School, for the most part, most staff members had been with us for at least 20 years. So this uh, was a pretty, pretty drastic shift. So we started to talk about what are the different things that we know the teachers to be fearful and staff to be fearful of and through that our administrative team worked along with pivot coaches we recognized the need to start diagnosing the issues that we were seeing through the implementation so we started grouping them into two different categories we used the book adaptive leadership to help us do this work so the first one was that we needed to address some technical challenges these were challenges that were easily identified and that we could address um, pretty easily with the resources that we, we currently had. The other category uh, is much more difficult to address and those were challenges that we titled in, as adaptive. So these were challenges that dealt more with people, attitudes, beliefs, and values. So as we started to identify some of these things, we looked at what are some deliberate practices we could put into place to address the adaptive challenges that teachers were struggling with. And we, we started to do that by first looking at our school norms. Next slide. So through our training uh, here at Oceanside High School, we've done a lot of training with Solution Tree around professional learning communities and our staff were very mindful about the time they spent together and focused on sharing data and best practice and then there was those norms that um, outlined the conduct that would be expected in those types of um, meetings. Um, but what we recognized is that it was time for us to begin um, reevaluating those norms and consider adopting new norms that aligned with um, better aligned with our work and that could positively also influence the culture we we're trying to create at, at Oceanside High School. As you can see in the norms, the, the one that always resonates with me here is that we wanted teachers um, to support each other and get to a place where we would commit to getting better 
and getting better together. Next slide. So uh, this is Juan Hernandez here, and this is where I'd like to jump in and talk a little bit about the teacher perspective. So again, as mentioned, um, my high school teacher uh, started in science up in Los Angeles area, two charter schools, and then uh, took a little break from uh, from the classroom environment and made my way back down to Oceanside, where I'm originally from, and back into a traditional public school. And I'm very excited to be able to use some of my industry experience to bring it back into the classroom. And so when we think about the culture that's being established here at Oceanside High School, we had to think about some of the issues that um, people don't necessarily want to address. And one of the first things that we needed to do was address this issue of vulnerability. We have uh, seven different pathway leads and co-leads here at Oceanside High School, and only three of us actually had a working relationship prior to rolling out the school-wide pathways. And so these three individuals also came to the table, as Teresa mentioned, with several years of experience of successful pathway implementation. So really to build our pathway without looking at this as a competition, although I still kind of look, look at this as a competition, um, <laughs> we needed to kind of get past that and really look at how can we be really vulnerable and honest with ourselves and open up about the challenges that each of our pathways were facing in this new implementation process and be willing to ask for help. And so that started just at our meetings, for example, we were starting with check-ins, and this is what a lot of our teachers are calling our kumbaya moments, right? Those chances, those opportunities for us to really just see how is everyone doing before we dive into the nitty gritty, the important things that help us move forward. How are you doing? What's going on in your classroom? What's, what, what's keeping you from moving forward? What are those roses? What are those thorns? And after that, we always end a meeting with uh, appreciations as well. So after a successful meeting or after things that's been going on in our lives, in our classroom, meetings that we've been having, what kind of appreciations do we want to get out there and make sure everyone is aware of? Again, this is all part of kind of getting past that, that comfort or discomfort that some of us have and really establishing a culture that's it's really friendly and, and welcoming to all staff. Uh, to help us build on that, we had to look at... Uh, something being proposed by another book that we're reading as a staff called Everyone Culture, An Everyone Culture. And An Everyone Culture really highlights this idea, as Teresa briefly mentioned, that really mistakes at our school can't just be seen as mistakes anymore. These really have to be look at, looked at as opportunities for growth. If we're gonna move forward, especially in this new beginning of pathways, we really have to not dwell on mistakes, as in these are problems, we can't move forward, we need to switch teachers, but rather, these are opportunities for us to really grow and become a, a stronger uh, unit. And so that growth culture um, through an everyone culture has been an important piece for us. Um, and looking at that, we also recognize that, look, you know, as teachers, we ask our students to grow and to change and look at uh, ways that we can improve. And so the an everyone culture really focuses on the idea that adults, not just children, not just our students, but adults can and need to keep growing. And so again, these errors are not no longer no longer seen as failures, but again as opportunities. We also looked at the area of professional development. Pivot's been a, a, a great partner for us in, in arranging some uh, professional development here during the school day and also outside of the school day that's been optional as well. We've had some pullout days just for our pathway leads. Although this is a school-wide implementation project, we needed to make some time for just the leaders of those pathways to be able to come together and again, be vulnerable to have those discussions and to learn from each other in terms of what best practices are already out there. And then finally, we just needed some time together. So that's been professional time through conferences. Um, conferences allow for certain travel. So spending some extra time in a car or on a plane with each other has also been really beneficial. Things that people don't normally get excited about, but once we're in those positions, you develop some great conversations and lead to some strategies that can be shared with each of our pathways. And then finally, at the end of the day, like everyone's asked to do, we reflect. We, we make sure we spend that time reflecting on either that conference, that professional development, or any issue that may be going on in the classroom. Right. And so a natural outcome of working within pathways and uh, via interdisciplinary across content areas was the implementation of project-based learning. And so we began some professional development that brought each pathway together a couple times a year, a couple times a year to begin learning how to create a good um, project-based unit that incorporated 
things like voice, choice, and agency in our students. Um, and in year one implementation, we had, as the slide so, shows, 75% of our teachers developed and implemented an interdisciplinary project. And this during this year was also the year that we went through our accreditation. And it was a, an area that was really highlighted in our report as um, something that teachers were doing and doing, uh, doing a very good job at it in regards to bringing opportunities for students to have a choice as to how they were going to demonstrate their learning. And then the, the opportunity to also embed those other CTE um, standards that we want students to also be uh, practicing through high school. Um, um, next slide. Yes, so in this slide, you're going to see in year one implementation, you're going here you're going to see a video that was taken of the project that our public service pathway worked on. The first semester they did all the behind the scenes work and then second semester was the implementation of the uh, zombie apocalypse. In this video, you're gonna see several different industry partners present on this day and um, they they didn't just arrive for the uh, for the actual implementation of the project they collaborated um, throughout first semester with our teachers and our students as they devised the plan for the apocalypse uh, incorporating all the industry expertise so um, Emily please roll that yeah foot <laughs> I will. It'll take just a second to uh, tee up. So we are on our way.
All right, we'll get back to uh, the PowerPoint and Teresa, you can keep going. All righty. All righty, next slide. All right, yep. So I, I hope you enjoyed that short uh, footage of our a zombie apocalypse. Um, and as a result of our uh, implementation of pathways, we're already beginning to see a positive impact. We have seen a slight decrease in some chronic absenteeism and uh, discipline referrals have actually were cut in half last year. Um, we attribute this to focusing on, you know, building um, connectedness with our ninth and 10th grade students and also cohorting students with teachers in their pathway. Uh, this year, we're going to work even uh, closer uh, with our counselors and our teachers to really bring the individualized student supports to all students that will include things like career planning and early intervention. It's our area of focus this year. Next slide. So again, um, and looking at the, the effects of the pathways, one of the things that we needed to really look at ourselves, especially from the teacher perspective, is communication and collaboration. So I'll give you for an example, we had a, a parent that I was speaking to and he was kind of, I was explaining to him about what pathways really are and he's telling me, you know, kids are really exposed to so much action these days, right? Especially all the movies that they watch and all the computer graphics. And he said, it's kind of hard for them to stay interested in your classroom stuff with everything else going on around them being so intense. And he said, so I think bringing back this type of education and when we say that we say career technical education, can really catch our attention again. This is somebody who, you know, went through the old ROP and wood shop and, and auto shop kind of uh, courses. And so that's forcing us as teachers to communicate more with our parents and the community about what's going on. So for example, you have teachers who maybe not even thought about social media as a classroom tool, more so as a personal tool, but now are looking at social media to highlight some of the things going on in the classroom, taking pictures with uh, industry professionals who are speaking to our students, uh, highlighting uh, projects of, of students, um, especially the CT projects. And so we're, we're taking advantage of those avenues that maybe weren't uh, being taken advantage of as an opportunity for communication and collaboration. Of course, we've always had back to school nights, but back to school nights now, besides being classroom experiences, also have an intro component where we can highlight or showcase some of the work that's being done as a result of our pathways. And of course, we have our informational nights for incoming students as well. There's this buzz being generated about the pathways and these incoming eighth graders, excuse me, eighth graders who are selecting these schools want to know what they're getting into. And so we've taken those advantage of those opportunities to share about that before they even get here. If you look at the student growth, uh, we he see here pictured uh, one of the students ambassadors who was present on our uh, new Pirate Day. Again, welcoming these eighth grade, stu eighth grade students to our campus. And these student ambassadors are, are taking more of an active role in a pathway that they're brand new to. So with barely you know a year's experience in, they were just jumping in to kind of get involved and, and share and brag about the pathway. And so that student growth also leads to uh, being able to look at themselves and potential careers because of the influx of, of industry presence in the classroom. So you have uh, architects, you have engineers who are coming in, for example, in our pathway or speak to the students and piquing their interests and causing them to really reflect on the paths that they've been chosen, that they thought they were choosing and maybe now would like to choose something different. And then these ambassadors and, of course, our students in general have had the opportunity to build relationships, not just with themselves, because, of course, they've had friends before, before Pathways, but now we're talking about really building strong relationships with teachers. So, again, the young lady seen here is actually taking a picture with a teacher she has never had before. It's an, actually an EL teacher, and the student would never have any contact with this EL teacher, but these opportunities that are being afforded to our students make those kind of relationships possible. And it's a great experience for both the teacher and the student. Next slide. Building on this idea of relationships, in the end, what we realize is that our relationships are really are bringing us results for both teachers and students. 
In the top right hand corner, we see a picture of two students again, an EL student and a student who uh, is comfortable with English, both working on a common project of building a solar water heater in class. Again, they may not have thought about working together in this type of capacity in the past, but now that we've had this influx of, of pathways into the school and project-oriented uh, uh, classes, these students are working together. Um, sim similarly, in the, in the left picture, the picture on the bottom here, we see a student who's part of the Health Careers Academy on a day where they welcome students from all the other pathways in to teach and show off the things that they've learned in Health Careers Academy. So it's a young lady, you know, showing the gentleman here how to listen for a heartbeat on some of the, the actual you know, great uh, equipment that they have there as part of the Health Careers Academy. And so I'll close with that little quote there from a student who says, look, when I think about my pathway experience, I feel knowledgeable now about my environment and really confident about how to make some change. Next slide. So our transformation does continue. We are in year two. We're continuing to work with our local junior college to bring our dual enrollment to our students. Uh, also looking at how we can align our dual enrollment and course offerings from Maricosta that align specifically with the different pathways. We continue to work on project-based learning. We've had one full pullout day for each pathway to uh, give them time to work together on uh, projects that they can implement for a semester. They start that work by discussing a, a driving question. And then we will continue to really work with our pathway leads and our leadership team to build their capacity to lead the work uh, within each pathway. Each pathway is made up of uh, about 25 teachers. So it's really important that we're mindful of really supporting the leaders of those pathways and guiding the work um, that we, we see happening within each pathway. And then um, we are looking at taking the steps to um, become Link Learning certified. And our first step will be, we already have a couple pathways that are looking at applying because we do feel we meet the, the silver standard for certification. So we're excited about applying for that this year. Next slide. I mentioned our early college credit and dual enrollment. Our, our, we, an, an important piece of the pathways and our CTE courses that we bring to our students is that um, as much as possible, we want those courses to be articulated with the local junior college so that students, if they pass the course successfully, successfully with the B or better, that they're able to apply and receive uh, junior college credit for those those courses. So that's something we're very mindful. Our Healthy Careers Academy and our Academy of Justice have done a great job of articulating their courses with the junior college. We have a few courses in our arts, digital media, and design pathway that are articulated, and we want to continue to work on that with our engineering um, and environmental science pathway. And another uh, big element that we want to support our students in is creating an opportunity for them to house all their incredible work around projects that they've done and learning that they've demonstrated in a, a digital portfolio. Students currently have digital portfolios, but there isn't a set structure for them to be feeding different pieces of evidence into the portfolio. So what we'll be doing this year is working the design team. The focus will be on creating a platform for what goes in the digital portfolio with the idea that evidence aligns with our school-wide learner outcomes. So then students would then use their portfolio to defend that they have met the school-wide learner outcomes, which are critical thinking and problem solving, being marketable workers, lifelong learners, effective communicators and healthy individuals as an example. Uh, next slide. And we do need to continue to expand our, our um, connections and collaboration with our industry partners. As you saw in the video, our public service is very connected with local industry and we just need to continue to build those relationships and have it just as strong in the other newer pathways. 
So we look forward to that opportunity. Next slide. Uh, this is another quote from one of our students in regards to what the pathway has um, done for her. And um, I'd also just like to close with, um, we are also beginning to see out in our community, our, our industry partners, our business owners are being uh, recognizing that our students that are out there applying for part-time jobs and navigating our community, that they are more confident, they are communicating um, well when they're out in public. I often get um, compliments from people in our community around the um, what they're recognizing in our students uh, in regards to their, their what they're learning as far as soft skills. So we're very excited about that. Alrighty. Great, well thank you so much, Teresa and Juan, um, for sharing what's going on at Oceanside. Um, it, you really are definitely enriching that high school experience for your students, and it's great to hear that the community has noticed that and responded as well, that they're, they're seeing students that are more in line with what they need as employees, so that's great. Um, and thank you, Robert and Dan, for providing us with more details about Beyond High School and linked learning and linked learning certification. Um, we do have some questions coming in, but we have got time for more. So folks um, out there in the audience, please feel free to send them in to us. Um, we will take them here in just a second. Um, before we get to them, I just want to remind you that you will get a copy of the slide deck and the recording. Um, these will be sent to you by email tomorrow. Um, we'll also post them on the Pivot Learning website, which is pivotlearning.org. Um, and you can also learn more about Beyond High School um, at that same URL, pivotlearning.org. Um, and actually, if you add forward slash beyond high school, um, you'll get straight to the beyond high school page. So let's go ahead and take some questions. Um, we've got some kind of overarching questions and then we're gonna actually start here with a very um, tactical kind of question. And Juan, this came in while you were speaking. Um, and it is, what is the STEM Teach to Learn program? Yeah, so I, I would probably speak to that. That is our, um, in our public service pa pathway, that is our pathway that prepares students to be future teachers. So they do okay. early education and then they actually um, go to our local elementary school and teach lessons and do observations at the local elementary school in preparation for uh, our future future teachers in our community. That's excellent. That is a great program. So thanks for clarifying that for us. Um, now we've got some more overarching questions, um, starting with, um, do students choose to come to Oceanside or can they choose a more traditional high school experience if they prefer? Um, that's a good question. We uh, live in a district that is zoned, so students are um, expected to attend their school um, that uh, they reside in the area. So they are school boundaries and we have two high schools in our in our district. So they based on where they live, they yes, they attend the school that within they reside. So but we do have students that have chosen to come here and we actually saw an increase in our enrollment this year um, at the beginning of the year of uh, an 100 additional students who are choosing to come to Oceanside High School. So uh, I attribute cool. that to the work that we're doing. Yeah, I think that speaks volumes <laughs> to what you're offering students. That's great. Um, what does the articulation look like? Did a college instructor come to the high school for that? What is the, the junior college facilitates meetings with our teachers and other local high schools. And we actually come together with the different deans of the different departments at the junior college. And we actually work together on curriculum so that we know that it aligns with the junior college. So Maricoast has been very collaborative and, and willing to work with us around helping us create um, curriculum that would be worthy of receiving junior college um, credits. So it's a collaborative uh, um, thing that we do with the junior college. And we actually had another question about the junior college. Were they involved in some of that pre-work um, in terms of, 
you know, determining what was needed in the community and, and developing the pathways? Yeah, actually, we're really fortunate that one of the, the junior colleges, the Dean of Career Education at Maricosta, was very committed to attending and working with us through the entire design process and submitting, you know, providing us with his input and expertise as to what the junior college was seeing in our in our local community and in our, our county. So yes, they were very involved. That's great. And that's, I'm sure that's part of why that's been so successful too. Um, let's see. So um, how do you ensure that those who go through the Pathways program end up in a job with a salary that affords them a living wage? Some healthcare fields and early childhood jobs don't always meet that requirement. I'm not 100% sure I understand the question, but the idea is that our students, part of our four-year plan will be that they have a rich internship experience that aligns with a career. And upon doing that um, internship, they would then be able to make some decisions around what they wanted to pursue in their future. It may be something that aligns with their pathway, you know, based on their experiences in their pathway, or it may have been an opportunity where they recognize that, you know what, this isn't really something I, I really want to do, but it surely, you know, I learned as a high school student that I don't want to do that. And then um, they could, you know, go off and pursue something else, but all the while they would have gathered all those soft skills that are really transferable, you know, regardless of uh, what career they choose to pursue. I think I think the other really important piece to look at is, you know, our school picked these pathways based on the labor market data for San Diego. And so it's the, what we picked is not going to necessarily work at each, mm -hmm. each city, each high school. So it's really important, I think, to do the work and find out what labor data suggests as future careers. And you, I mean, if we were trying to do a big steel industry job and put a bunch of welders together and we were not in the right market for it, that's, it's not going to be very successful. So labor market data is really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is Robert uh, uh, here. Yeah, I say the the key piece here and the pathway is really looking at high wage, high growth sectors, but also acknowledging that there are entry level positions that may not, uh, you know, be a living wage initially, but hopefully, being sure the kids are getting into programs uh, that have that opportunity to get into high high wage, high growth jobs uh, as one of the focuses of the work here, and that certainly looks different in different uh, communities. Great, thank you for all those insights. Um, we've got a couple questions um, about reaction. Um, so starting with, what has parent reaction been to this change from a you know, more traditional high school curriculum to the pathways? Um, it's, it's honestly been mixed. One of the biggest concerns was uh, parents were concerned about what would happen to our advanced placement courses. And um, I am pleased to share that our um, AP courses and enrollment is up by hundreds this year. Uh, last year we had 849 students enrolled in AP classes. This year we have over 1,100 students taking AP courses. And we added AP courses like AP Environmental Science that aligned with our pathway. Um, I also explained um, to our community that we aren't giving up anything. What we are doing is, all students have a requirement to take electives, but what we are doing is we're bringing richer, more rigorous electives to our students that align with careers that um, are happening out in, um, out in our community. And they're bringing or exposing them to the world of work that is going to then help them make decisions about their future after leaving us. Um, it also creates opportunities that when when students leave, they can speak to the things that they're really good at. Um, and you know, previously our electives uh, didn't do that for our students. And I think Teresa, you also mentioned those soft skills that they're developing, and I think those pathways experience really you know gives them the opportunity to not only learn about those but to, to implement them and put them into practice in a way that um, you might not in some other uh, you know curricular areas so that's great 
Um, the other question about reaction was teacher reaction. Um, and have you seen um, attrition from teachers with this shift? I think, you know, coming from the, the insider perspective, I guess we have both both camps. You know, I'd be lying to you if we say that teachers are always super excited about every change that happens at the school. But the reality is we also have a great number of students or excuse me, teachers in each of the pathways who are really excited about the change. Um, there's teachers who have, you know, careers that they had before they enter the classroom and CTE now offers them a, an opportunity to try and bring some of that career experience back into the classroom and, talk, and to talk about maybe some of their passions that they thought they had to leave behind once they came into the classroom. So there's definitely some buzz with teachers who have that industry experience. Teachers who don't have industry experience are excited about being able to do project-based learning with the CTE teachers as well. So there's definitely some teachers who are super excited and, and we, we're definitely trying to Get, get that excitement to catch fire with the, the other teachers as well. And of course, there are some other teachers who are a little bit resistant because as, teach, as uh, Teresa has mentioned, you know, we have teachers who've been teaching for quite a few years now and, and this is a big change, but the best thing that we've been, that we really try to do here at the school is to, to get everyone to converse, to have these conversations, to really have those meetings. We always joke around saying that, look, we want the real meetings to happen in our classrooms. We don't want a bunch of parking lot meetings. We want everyone to be open and honest about what their reservations are here inside the class. And so as long as we're communicating, we feel like we're still moving forward. Thank you, Juan. Um, that, that was great perspective and, and insight. And yes, I mean, any any change is, is always hard for people. It, it's a process to to adjust to that. So and it sounds like you've got lots of great processes and supports to um, help your team um, all adjust to that. So um, it looks like we've got time for one more question. Um, do you think that the mixing, and that is in quotes, of students from different curricula areas um, creates more respect for different work fields? Or would it be beneficial for everyone to take a shop or cooking or art class rather than just academic courses to encourage more respect? Um, I, I think if I understood the question correctly, I think it's been a benefit. I, I think one of our teachers has, has done a really good job of explaining that, look, just because a student picks a, a pathway doesn't mean that they're now locked into pursuing that career and all of their college plans are now centered around that. You know, we have students who are in the environmental science and engineering pathway who, you know, think that it's just about engineering. And now all of a sudden, because of these industry professionals are learning that you can be a welder and still be involved in a green tech company. You can be somebody who's interested in solar panels and not necessarily have to be working on the designing of the panels, but can be working as an installer and use their hands-on set of skills. And so I think the mixing has been really great um, because it's telling students that, look, you're not locking into just what your traditional idea of that pathway is. Our students who are taking our emergency responder classes, for example, are looking at not just people who ride along in an ambulance, but you're looking at people who are teaching, you know, the, the emergency responder classes, you have people who are working, you know, as lifeguards. And so there's just a variety of experiences that that the, the CT approach and in, inviting these industry professionals really exposes to our students. And so they don't get locked down into this preconceived idea of what the pathway or what that industry really looks like. Yeah, it just it sounds like it's such an eye opening and world opening <laughs> experience for students to um, to learn these things. And Teresa, as you mentioned earlier, you know, they may find something that they're completely passionate about or they may find this isn't a career direction I want to go. But um, there's here's what I like about it and new areas to explore. So um, I think uh, it sounds great. And it sounds like both your students and um, the staff and the community are really benefiting from it all. So we definitely wish you luck as you continue in your journey um, and particularly towards that linked learning certification. That will be um, a great uh, benefit and badge of honor for you to uh, earn. So thank you again, Teresa and Juan for being with us and sharing your experiences. And um, thank you, Dan and Robert for again, sharing um, information about linked learning. We will provide um, some more information about linked learning and beyond high school in the follow-up email that you received tomorrow. Um, as Dan said, um, we are going to be launching the self-assessment tools. This um, will help guide you towards those certifications. 
Um, so you'll be receiving a second email um, probably next week or the following week once those are ready. So keep an eye on your inbox over the next couple of weeks for more information um, about Beyond High School and Linked Learning. Um, I also just wanted to let you know that Pivot will be sponsoring another webinar on November 6th. Um, Teresa and Juan mentioned the book on Everyone Culture and talked about becoming a developmentally deliberate organization. And that's what we're going to take a closer look at in November's webinar. Um, Joe Ashby, a principal within the Monterey Peninsula School District, is going to share his school's experience with um, a growth culture pilot that was conducted um, last year with MPUSD and Pivot Learning. Uh, and we will include a link for you to register for that webinar in the email you'll receive tomorrow. And one final um, request, if when you log off from the webinar, you could take just a few seconds to answer the short feedback survey that will pop up. Um, that will um, help us craft um, additional programming for you and make sure that we're providing information that's useful. So thanks again, everyone, for joining us. And thanks to our panelists. I hope everybody has a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.